I would also like to uh, introduce our uh, panelists. Uh, first, uh, our moderator, Dr. John Pratt. Uh, thank you very much for the introductory speech. Uh, Dr. John Pratt is Emeritus Professor of Criminology at the Institute of Criminology at Victoria University of Wellington in New Zealand. His field of uh, research are um, comparative penology and the history of social and history and uh, sociology of punishment. His books include Panel Populism, Contrasts in Punishment, and Law Insecurity and Risk Control, Now Liberal Governance, and the Populist Revolt. His writings have been translated in 12 languages, and he has been invited to lecture on his uh, research at universities in North America, Latin America, Europe, and Australia. The awards he has received for his work include the 2009 Radzinovitz Award by the Editorial Board of the British Journal of Criminology, an invitation to take up a one-year fellowship at the Strauss Institute for Advanced Studies in Law and Justice at New York University between 2010 and 2011, uh, election to fellowship of the Royal Society of New Zealand in uh, 2012, and in 2013 he was awarded the Society's Maison Duty Award uh, medal given to a nation's preeminent social scientist. Um, as uh, Dr. Pratt highlighted, the order uh, will be first Dr. Imoja Richards, and she will, uh, she will be talking about the situation in Australia and the title of her lecture is From Past to Present, the question of populism, extremism, and the far right in uh, Australia. She's a lecturer in criminology at Deakin University. She research researches in the areas of social news and alternative forms of online media, including the political economy of counterterrorism and the performance of security in response to social crisis. She has books with Raoul Sledge and Manchester University Press exploring the political economy of now jihadist and counterterrorist movements and the public scholarly practices of uh, criminologists. Her next book, Global Heating and the Australian Far Right, will be published by Rouse Sledge in 2023. Our next speaker will be Rachel Sharpless. Uh, she will focus on racism and prejudice in Australia with a presentation titled Racism, White Privilege and White Supremacy in Australia. She is a lecturer of sociology in the, so uh, in the School of Social Sciences at the Western uh, Sydney University. She's a member of the Challenging Racism Project and the Diversity and Human Rights Research Center at VSU and uh, the Center for Resilient and Inclusive Societies. Dr. Sharpless' key areas of research include displaced persons, refugees and migrants in local and global settings, statelessness, citizenship and belongings, racism and anti-racism, and spaces of solidarity and resistance. Recent uh, publications uh, include anti-asylum seeker sentiment in the Australian population, claims of anti-white uh, racism in Australia, and discrimination in sharing economy uh, platforms. Sharpless manuscript, uh, Spaces of uh, Solidarity, was published by Berkhan Books in 2020. Finally, uh, this takes us to our third speaker, Dr. Josh Roos, who will talk uh, um, about masculinity, populism, and religion in Australia. He is a political sociologist and associate professor at the Alfred Deakin Institute for Citizenship and Globalization in the School of Humanities and Social Sciences at Deakin University in Melbourne. His research focuses primarily on uh, political and religious extremism, populism, and the intersection uh, with citizenship, economies, masculinities, and the rule of law. He's currently a chief investigator on an uh, Australian Research Council funded study, the far right, intellectuals, masculinity and citizenship, and lead chief investigator of an other ERC funded project, anti-women online movements, pathways and patterns of uh, participation. And now we uh, know very well our panelists. Uh, I would like to make um, a reminder that uh, this panel will be recorded and live streamed on the CPS YouTube channel. And I would also like to note that uh, we do the Q&A session after the completion of the presentations. You can write your questions in the chat box or you can raise your virtual hand and pose your questions in person. And with that, uh, I will give uh, over the word to our first speaker. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks Anita and John. Um, I'll just share my slides just a moment. <clears throat> 
Oops. Okay. All right. So this title might be a little bit misleading, um, but today I'm not going to focus on trying to redefine populism uh, for the Australian context. Um, but what I am going to do is try to think about how a critical perspective um, on populism, drawing on some of its um, key ideas, can help us to understand uses of environmental politics by far-right actors or um, nativist and white nationalist actor, actors that we sometimes describe as far-right um, in different um, stages through Australian history. So this will involve first elaborating a couple of critical perspectives on populism um, and then turning to the various sort of environmentalist and pseudo-environmentalist uh, positions that are espoused by uh, white nationalist actors. So this research is mostly drawn from a forthcoming co-authored monograph, um, which is titled Global Heating and the Australian Far Right. Okay, so before I go into any um, detail about the groups and individuals classified as far right here, um, I just want to outline a few theoretical insights that might inform how we can understand populism in this context. So I've given some of these authors a pretty short shrift here, but just drawing on some of their ideas for the purposes of my um, analysis. Um, first, we can look at Mood's understanding of populism as a thin-centred ideology, um, which can be combined with other ideologies. So it rests on a distinction between the pure people and the corrupt elite. And um, the populist radical right, you know, has to be defined as such uh, and to those ends rather than simply populist. So Mundon and Winter um, argue that um, the rhetoric around populism or the populist hype can sometimes obscure the real conditions of a sort of a social threat emerging from the rising far and extreme right. So they also argue that the concept of populism can erroneously cast right-wing extremism as sort of emerging organically uh, from a populous community or base, so from a kind of a plentiful um, community, um, when these attitudes are sometimes, you know, a product of social divisions, um, which are actually entrenched and encouraged by powerful actors and, and through apparatus such, such as the media. Uh, so they also argue, Mondon and Winter um, and uh, Aurelian Mondon and others as well, have argued that the different typologies of populism can, can sometimes also sort of obscure the complicity of liberal institutions, uh, including the media and political establishments. So Benjamin Moffat, uh, particularly in the Australian context, has argued that populism is a political style rather than an ideology or a set of policy positions. So this style might be characterised by an appeal to, again, the elite um, the people, sorry, versus the elite, um, and also the leverage of crisis or threat narratives. Um, and this often occurs through performative and emot emotive media, um, rallies as well, and, and sort of forms of direct communication that bypass legacy media. Um, so this is important, I think, in understanding the propagandizing function of the different kind of utilitarian, I would say, uses of environmental politics by different types of nativist um, and far-right white nationalist uh, groups and individuals in Australian political history. Um, so in this light, I also just want to um, recognise that um, populism, you know, is used in the literature um, about Australian far-right political history pretty extensively, and it's it's used um, really with reference to the propaganda propagandizing techniques that are employed, um, and so this this tends to sort of stand a little bit in contrast to some other uses of you know populism as a descriptor, um, which don't understand it necessarily as explicitly far-right, or which might you know incidentally uh, serve to sort of obscure that fact. Um, and obviously, of course, populism itself is not defined to, you know, confined by, um, confined to, I should say, sorry, you know, the left or the right of the political spectrum. But obviously, when I'm using the terminology here, I'm looking at the, the propagandizing techniques and the utilitarian usage of environmental tropes and uh, territorial tropes as well. So hopefully that gives you a bit of context of what I'm sort of talking about here. Okay, so 
Contemporary environmentalist expressions on the part of white supremacist groups can't be understood without first recognising the impact of Australia's colonial history. So this history was marked by the British genocide of Indigenous peoples who had been occupying the mainland for more than 65,000 years, and it extends to their current and ongoing criminalisation, dispossession and displacement. So it's important to acknowledge as well how um, the historical lack of honest appraisal of Australian colonisation has resulted in a lack of recognition of Indigenous people's spiritual and cultural practices which are related to land and country. So Australian nativist, white nativist relationships to the land um, have conversely um, ignored this and they've been historically predicated on resource extractivism and uses um, of the land for economic ends as well as um, European style agriculture to those ends um, but also in the notion of the uh, the establishment of the sort of Australian nativist legend which was partly um, curated through this idea of a spiritual taming of a harsh natural environment so not to go into too much detail about that, but <clears throat> to understand that kind of um, birthing or origin narrative for sort of contemporary uh, white or colonial Australia, it's important to recognise Australia's history as a British colony and a penal colony for England. And that also had a profound impact on the settlers' relationship with both the British Empire and the environment. Excuse me. So... In this light, it's important to recognise how white nationalism in Australia at Federation had both Republican laborist and imperial colonialist elements. So a unique Australian legend or national identity developed in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, largely in response to challenges faced by predominantly working class British and Irish migrant settlers. Um, so this identity was characterised by, and convicts, um, a rejection of British colonialism and a desire for independence. Uh, and it was centred around ideals such as self-reliance and egalitarianism, but only for able-bodied heteronormative white men. So the legend also related to the installation of the White Australia policy um, in 1901 at Federation, uh, which enshrined the exclusive rights of white workers. And it also protected employers on the flip side from... Um, perceived threats of non-white economic competition. So <clears throat> this also followed a recent history in the 1850s. I'm not going to go through every decade, but um, to highlight the important moments um, of Republican laborist um, white nationalism that was developing in the 1850s, um, you know, exemplified through the, the racist riots um, by white sort of so-called diggers um, on the gold fields in Victoria and New South Wales. Um, and there was also, it's important to recognise, um, this wasn't this, um, it wasn't sort of uniformly um, sort of white diggers who, who were active in the gold fields. And um, there, there was, um, yeah, there's a lot of literature um, and scholarship, particularly in, you know, Australian labour history journals as well about the different involvements of the different political groups. But a substantial um, contingent were targeting Chinese miners with racial violence. And the Eureka flag became associated with this. Um, and now as sort of a, a sort of a symbolic hallmark, I guess, of this crossover almost between left and right, and not at all to homogenize, you know, um, or uh, any attribution of, 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 of racism here, you know, Eureka can refer to either working class sol solidarity and Australian nationalism versus you know, British colonialism, um, or and or it can refer to, you know, it, the exclusivist rights of white workers. So it's used both by white supremacist groups like Jim Salim's Australia First Party that was established in 96. Um, and he has, um, he was a prominent neo-Nazi, he's a prominent neo-Nazi sort of um, intellectual and activist, as I'll mention later. But it's also used by coalitions on the left, um, not with reference to uh, white nationalism or white exclusivism. So the Eureka flag also appears in um, sort of union labour movements. So two key ruralist dimensions of the Australian legend were important in developing nativist perspectives on land, and this was the Bushmen mm -hmm. and the Larrikin. So the archetypal figures um, developed in response to British colonialism um, and also in response to the sort of trials of surviving in an unforgiving Australian landscape. 
So the Bushmen saw themselves as deeply connected to the land and valuing physical labour, and the Larrikin reject, rejected um, who they saw as British colonial masters, and this included the British command at Gallipoli. In World War I, um, the command, the gov um, governing body in the Eureka Stockade um, on the goldfields, um, and also women sometimes who were seen as representatives of their imperial fathers. Um, so both um, identities um, or components of this Australian legend celebrated symbolic self-reliance and independence and physicality over intellectual pursuits. Okay. <clears throat> so the Australian colonial legacy of exploiting or using local lands and territories um, for profit um, often at the expense of Indigenous peoples, continues to this day through large-scale resource projects that result in displacement and dispossession and destruction. But um, some far and extreme right actors in the lead up to World War II were less concerned um, with this pattern of domination, and instead they aimed to forge a, a sort of a radical nativist movement based on the ideals of race and place, so a sort of an Australian inflection of blood and soil. So these figures, publications and organisations emerged um, largely in the interwar period. Um, and David Bird in his book, Nazi Dreamtime, covers um, you know, major influences um, during this time. <clears throat> so I think they could, they could be said to um, draw on these kind of quasi-Volkish sentiments of blood and soil. Um, and they were constituted largely through literary magazines, conferences and news media, um, which Bird describes as a sort of a form of culture camp or almost a kind of Gramscian metapolitics. So trying to bring about cultural change prior to political revolution. So figures in this movement promoted the development of a unique Australian form of white nativist identity predicated on associations between culture, race, land and territory. Uh, and one way in which they sought to popularise these ideologies uh, was by gradually incorporating poets, artists and prose writers into the Australia First Movement project. So this project was led by Percy um, Inky, so-called Stevenson, who was a writer, activist and influential publisher in the 20s and 30s, and he was sometimes colloquial, colloquially referred to as the Bunyip critic. <clears throat> so... The Australia First movement was a fascist organisation that sought to promote a white Anglo-Saxon identity and exclude non-white and non-Anglo-Saxon peoples from Australian society. Uh, many of its members were interned during World War II um, and the organisation was characterised by its admiration for Adolf Hitler and its advocacy of totalitarianism and racial purity. So the Australia First movement held anti-Semitic, anti-imperial and anti-socialist views and it's self-described as in favour of national socialism. So importantly, uh, the publicist publication served as a key mouthpiece for the Australia First movement, publishing um, both kind of literary and um, other discursive um, texts. So this um, also the, the press of the publicist and the Australia First movement also existed as part like within a larger ideological framework of ultra conservative and far right um, um, cultural and literary outlets that were circulating in Australia during that time. So this included the Catholic Weekly, The Advocate, uh, Norman Lindsay's Fran Folico Press, um, and also the short-lived magazine, The National Socialist. Um, but in his writings, Stevenson drew upon and also incorporated ideological tropes that were already present in major sort of more mainstream, not less um, explicitly right wing, um, certainly less explicitly anti-Semitic works of the time, um, including Miles Franklin's depictions of the Australian outback. But he also drew on D.H. Lawrence's focus on vitality and anti-modernity um, and his famous 1936 text, The Foundations of Culture in Australia, was inspired by um, Nietzschean literary tendencies um, of Jack Lindsay, for instance, or William Bailbridge. Bailbridge also, um, close to that time, authored an unpublished poem called Palingenesis. So um, the oppression of Indigenous peoples by the nativist extreme right was compounded as well in this period by the fact that several prominent nationalist literary actors of the interwar time 
um, express nominal support for the plight of Indigenous peoples, but also support for Nazi Germany. So they drew aesthetic inspiration from both the German dream and the Aboriginal dream time, or the Alkaringa, as an inspiration for an Australian nativist ideal. This was an attempt to kind of reconcile blood and soil uh, politics for the Australian colonial context. So in the early 40s, members of, members of a group called the Jindi Warabak Literary Group um, at the University of Adelaide um, joined together with members of Australia First or the Australia First Movement, um, and they uh, wrote a series of texts which incorporated Indigenous symbols and cultural heritage, um, blending those aesthetic aspects with quasi-Nietzschean expressions which are characteristic of Volkish thought. So to establish a link between, I'm not quite sure on the time, so feel free just to um, speak. Yeah. We've got about five minutes left. Okay, I'll race through. Um, I'll just say, you know, um, a last point on this, Stevenson's, um, in his efforts to establish this sort of, in, you know, pseudo indigeneity, this connection between race and place, as Stevenson called it, uh, he, he even asserted his own connection um, um, ostensibly between the genetic bloodlines of Indigenous people in Australia and his own so-called Aryan race. Um, and that was uh, called the Black Caucasian Thesis, which was expounded by a, an Adelaide-based anthropologist in 1925. Uh, okay, got quite a lot to get through. So, mm. all right. So maybe just uh, going over this slide quickly. Um, so after World War II, the growth of cities due to industrialization um, and the emergence of sort of multicultural Australia contributed to a renewed focus on anti-urban sentiments among the far right. You know, one of the very prominent organisations in that regard was the Australian League of Rights, um, which was described by um, the National Inquiry into Racist Violence in 1991 as the legal face of anti-Semitism, the best organised and most substantially financed racist organisation in Australia so the Australian League of Rights included British Empire loyal, loyalism as well as anti-communism, and its members sought to infiltrate the Australian country and Liberal parties. Um, it also attempted to make from um, 1946 or 19, yeah, so being established in 1946 initially in South Australia, it was then nationalised in 1960. Um, but after 1946, the ALR also established its Victorian branch through which the founder, Eric Butler, um, and John Weller attempted to um, sort of um, enter into uh, the early organic farming movement. So they made speeches to the Victorian Compost Society and became involved with the New Times magazine, which was a social credit theory magazine, which modelled uh, was modelled on the um, uh, New English Weekly newspaper. I might just skip. Yeah. Yeah, this is the last one. Sorry. Can I have a couple of minutes? Well, you've got three minutes left. Okay. Yeah, I can do that. So <clears throat> another um, aspect that um, started to gain traction, so post the 1960s was um, uh, Australian far-right groups' reflections of the sort of populationist or population reduction um, discourses that were emerging in progressivist environmental movements um, from the 60s. Um, yeah, so on the previous slide, you know, Jim Salim um, stated in his thesis, his PhD thesis, um, the synthesis of an environmentalist argument against immigration within a populist nationalist framework directed at overseas economic forces and internal traitors was inherently radical. And this kind of developed into um, now on this slide, we see a kind of a quasi-bio-regionalist focus emergent among some groups. Um, so this was extant in the, the so-called national anarchists that rejected the sort of progressivist political anarchist ethic of egalitarianism, um, but they did also, but they did emphasise, you know, radical hi hierarchies, but along sub-state lines. Um, and again, this was another iteration of connections to race and place. Um, another um, tendency, which which doesn't immediately appear really to be that environmentally focused, but was based on sort of place and territory as well, and also connected to the sort of Australian legend um, in its 
um, connections to the Anzac history um, was the importance of militarism and military histories. So I've got some examples up there of leaders of the different groups at different periods uh, and the importance of their own military histories. Um, but you know, and another case in point, um, during from the 80s was Jack Van Tongren's Australian nationalist movement that I'll just highlight from this time, you know, that group and others started to recruit more actively from the Return Services League. Um, and they drew inspiration, the AM in particular, from sort of various populist Australian historical figures like Ned Kelly, Henry Lawson, so poets, miners, and bushmen um, mm. in what one historian described as a proto fascist historical cadre. Um, yeah. So the AM story stated that that group advocated for racially pure folk communities bound together by loyalty to blood and soil and living culturally fulfilled lives in harmony with the rest of nature. Okay, I better stop there. Um, but that's that gives you the, the main points. So, um, yeah, we can revisit some of those in the questions if, if you want to follow up with anything. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Rachel. Um, thanks, John. I'll just share my screen here as well. Just make sure everyone can see that. Okay, hopefully. Yes, excellent. Okay, so um, I'm going to veer a little bit away from uh, focus on, on sort of far right groups in Australia, not too much, but I want to sort of um, talk today about uh, how far right sort of ideologies, I guess, have started to manifest in the general um, or mainstream population in Australia. Um, and I'm going to focus a bit on um, racism, white privilege and white supremacy in that. I also talk a little bit in this, um, this talk about anti-white racism, um, and this partially because it relates to a, a project that I'm working on that we're going to talk about and um, show a bit of data on, um, but also I think because it's increasingly um, present in mainstream platforms in Australia. Um, and I also think because it's a, a byproduct of white supremacy um, and white privilege, uh, particularly when it's under threat. And so I think it's quite topical and pertinent um, to where we currently are um, at the moment. So in 2018 in Australia, Pauline Hanson, who we've already mentioned a few times um, here is the, is the leader of a right-wing populist party in Australia called the White One Nation Party. Um, she submitted a motion to the Australian Senate um, that, that, that is, so as in the Senate, acknowledged the deplorable rise of anti-white racism and attacks on Western civilization, and that it is, and I quote, okay to be white. While the motion um, was actually narrowly defeated, narrowly defeated um, in emphasis there, so it was 28 to 31, and that narrow defeat included the ruling conservative Liberal Party um, at the time voting in favour of the, of the motion. And it's quite significant that a white supremacist slogan um, made its way into the legislative chamber of Australia's parliament. It also highlights, I think, the increasing normalisation of claims of anti-white racism in Australia and also a fervent need by those who make those claims to have it acknowledged and legitimised. So Hanson's motion um, constitutes, I think, a claim of anti-white racism um, and also a threat to white privilege that it's increasingly evident in Australian society. These are claims that articulate a loss of privileged status of Anglo-Celtic heritage um, and the perceived ambivalence of the Australian government about this change in status. It also shows prejudice and loss associated with increased immigration, such as reduced access to um, health services and employment, amongst others. Also a claim of white ownership over our national identity and territory. White privilege remains a significant inhibitor, I think, of anti-racism um, efforts in Australia and left unexamined examined, white privilege has contributed to claims of anti-white racism and the solidification of a white national identity, sorry, identity that is exclusionary and harmful. So these claims of anti-white racism and white privilege have been enabled, I think, by a white ring, right wing nationalist infiltration into mainstream discourses, perpetuated by politicians and the media, but also deeply embedded in the attitudes of a segment um, of the Australian population. And while these sediments have long existed in the Australian psyche, um, and I think Imogen's talk highlights that really well. It's heightened in contemporary times by a greater tolerance and legitimacy given to white supremacy and national populist views. And as such, I think it represents a quite unique and underexamined perspective um, on white privileged discourses in Australia. So um, I'm going to show some 
um, of the data that I've been collecting or the research that I've been doing over the last few years um, in a minute. But basically, I've been looking at um, research that sort of examines the presence of a white victimhood sentiment in Australia and the associated claims of anti-white racism um, that go with it. And I've sought to place these claims in the context of Australia as both a settler colonial and a multicultural nation. I've argued that the de denial of racism and white privilege is an obvious extension of both the failure to positively address ind Indigenous sovereignty and dispossession in Australia and the realities of Australia as a migrant nation. And I've sought to understand how claims of anti-white racism and um, white privilege are present in the broader population, what role structures and institutions play in its uptake um, and how it can be arrested before manifesting in forms of extremist uh, behaviour. And I've tend to focus on that general uh, mistrust and disenfranchisement um, of the societal base rather than those extremist positions. And that's an intended position on my, heart, um, my behalf. I perceive claims of anti-white racism and its effects to be deeply embedded in the attitudes and behaviours of the broader society, not just an extremist um, marginal fringe. And I also believe that addressed at a societal level, the misuse and harms associated with the move towards these more extremist um, positions can um, be arrested. So wider acknowledgement of sy systemic racism and white privilege in this broader population um, is a key intervention for generating broader buy-in um, for that anti-racism action. Um, I've used a little bit a concept um, that Gassan Hage um, put forward um, like over, a little over 20 years ago now in his book White Nation where he talks about the white warrior and it helps me conceptualise, I think, a group of white Australians who believe themselves to be victims of anti-white racism. So they're increasingly vocal, for example, about their perceived prejudices against them, prejudices that they um, associate with increased immigration, the loss of privileged status of Anglo-Celtic heritage and a perceived um, ambivalence from the Australian government about this change in status. And I think this concept can probably ex be extended um, in more contemporary times too to also include a fear or a worry around the perceived loss of a white um, national identity. These fears, I think, are not constrained to the private sphere, nor can they be attributed solely to errant individuals. They're present, I think, across a wide section um, of Australian society. We see it manifest in the political and public discourses on asylum seekers, um, anti-Chinese sentiment found in the commentary on um, government uh, corruption and real estate investment, Islamophobia, and uh, more recent commentary in Australia around um, and put inverted commas African gangs. Um, those claims or these kinds of claims, I think, have found traction globally as well in the UK, the US, and, and many parts of Europe. Um, there was a high profile case of global, Google memo author James Damore suing Google for discrimination against white males. Um, in 2018, the UK Shadow Education Secretary, Angela Rayner, stated that the focus on women and ethnic minority groups in the UK education system have inadvertently negative, negatively impacted white working class males. So these claims, of course, um, traverse very complex categorizations, including the impacts of class and gender, but the common dominant framing is a racial one, a perceived discrimination because of being white. Those who make claims of anti-white racism could be described as ordinary people um, expressing problematic, but essentially commonplace concerns around identity um, and belonging. And in a sense, that's true. But in unpacking the nuances of how we construct and practice national identity and belonging, we must be careful not to def deflect from the role both individual and institutional racism, including white privilege, play in those commentaries. There is an unexamined sense of ownership over the national space that comes through in these commentaries, a whitewashing of Australian history that ignores both the Indigenous history of the land and the contributions of immigration and multiculturalism. And there's privilege in being able to ignore um, these things. There's also a sense of injustice, I think, manifesting a perceived discrimination um, because of being white, which in turn is attributed to a strengthening of the position of non-whites um, at white Australia's uh, ex expense. So I want to um, just quickly go through um, some data that we've been collecting um, as part of a, a re the research group that I'm part of over the last couple of years. And the first one I will look at is just some attitudinal data um, that we've collected in a survey, a big national survey we did in 2016. There are about 6,000 respondents um, to this survey. And the survey actually covered a wide range of topics, including attitudes towards cultural diversity, immigration, white privilege, experiences of racism, 
Um, but from this data, this big data set, we isolated 38 respondents who um, made claims of anti-white racism and we analysed um, that data um, around attitudes. So the dem demographic data showed that males are slightly um, more likely to make claims of anti-white racism than females. Um, you can see the stats up there. The majority of claims were made um, by 46 to 55-year-olds, um, uh, followed by 36 to 45 year olds and 18 to 25 year olds. So a young to middle aged demographic, if you like. The most common level of um, education was a trade or TAFE qualif qualification, um, but possibly um, differing to a lot of uh, research on demographics in this area, university education um, rated second highest. Almost half the respondents were employed um, with retirees and home duties, um, the next two. Um, common, most common employment types. 60% um, identified as Christian, uh, followed by no religion, agnostic or atheist. Um, and those making claims of white, white um, racism, sorry, the vast majority or 90% <coughs> um, born in Australia with 97% speaking English. These... Um, Findings, I think, show that there's a large cross-section um, of anti-white racism claims um, in that population. The second data, which is um, in the table that you can see up here now, uh, or sorry, actually, it's the, the same sort of demographic data, but this one looks a little bit more at those who made claims of anti-white racism um, and their attitudes um, towards culture, uh, cultural diversity. So we found that, for example, um, those who made claims of anti-white racism were like more likely to hold negative um, attitudes towards cultural diversity. They were more um, likely to admit that they're racist and feel comfortable doing so. Um, they were more likely to have an assimilationist view of immigration and to hold negative views of new and emerging migrant groups. This suggests a high level of intolerance towards the principles um, of multiculturalism, which in turn, I think, fuels that discombobulation white Australians feel around their current status of um, privilege in Australian society. The next um, one uh, data that I've got up here is actually some more qualitative and it's we conducted a discourse analysis of some of the claims of anti-white racism that were made. Um, and we're attempting to try and sort of understand the underlying tenure and drivers um, of those comments. And in particular, um, we looked at the role these discourses play in the development, reinforcement, le legitimation um, and reproduction of white dominance. I've got some examples up on the screen. I won't read through them, but you can just look at them while I um, talk about what we found um, in these kinds of comments. We found a discourse of anti-white racism that's framed by a perceived threat to a white Australian national identity and that this was... Um, I think reflective of key mechanisms of institutional racism and in particular white privilege. They're encapsulated in three key themes. Um, the first is the perceived elevation of migrants at the expense, at the expense of white Australians um, and in particular through anti-discrimination policies, leading to a heightened sense that white Australians um, are being discriminated against. The second theme is the white paranoia so that perceives the white Australian national identity is under threat by the presence of ethnic minorities who disrupt the dominance of white Australia and this is coupled with a hardening resolve to protect it even if the nature of that identity um, is contested. The third um, is that these claims are intrinsically linked to the privileging of white Australians as the owners of the national space and identity and this is accompanied by a sense of loss of control um, over the nature of that space. So these themes sort of highlight the increasingly fearful and racialized tone of Australia's national identity um, debates. And actually, just as Imogen was talking, then I was thinking about some of these quotes because they really do lie with um, some of the comments Imogen was making around, you know, blood and soil and that nativist idea of, um, you know, generational attachment um, and ownership over um, that territorial land. So those who make claims of anti-white racism um, express a fear of immigration and its embodied other. They see change as a threat to their status and privilege, and they see their whiteness as a racial category that affords prejudice against them. They worry about what the nation use it as an expression of their national belonging. These perceived prejudices are associated with increased immigration, the loss of their privileged position, and a perceived government ambivalence um, around this change in status. <clears throat> 
So this group is now prevalent, like I said before, in a cross-section of Australian society and their fears and concerns are emboldened and legitimised by a resurgent white supremacy in global and domestic politics. And these contrib contributions have contributed to a radicalized, sorry, a racialization of being white that is now expressed through far-right agendas of white solidarity and white nationalism. The last thing I just wanted to um, touch on is the mainstreaming of some of these um, far-right ideologies that um, we see occurring in Australia. And I want to just give some examples here um, of where I see um, that data that I just presented sort of um, appearing in this in this sort of mainstream um, platforms. So the first example is just the use of politicians um, and right-wing commentators to mainstream the events um, on, and views of race hate speakers. So we've just finished a project looking at race hate speaker tours in Australia um, and some of these um, insights come from that. So, for example, Senator Malcolm Roberts, who's a member of the One Nation Party, used his official government Facebook page to promote um, the Gavin McGuinness and Tommy Robinson deplorables tour in 2018. Senator Pauline Hanson, who's the leader of the One Nation Party, um, invited Lauren Southern to dinner during her and Stefan Molyneux's 2018 um, uh, speaker tour. Former Deputy Prime Minister uh, Barnaby Joyce said he had, and I quote, politically and economically fallen in love um, with Lauren. And in 2000, um, so 2022, Jordan Peterson was invited to deliver um, a speech for politicians at Parliament House, which included the former Prime Minister Scott Morrison and other conservative politicians. Um, where he espoused his views on traditional family values, climate change denial, and freedom of speech. The Australian Parliament, these are examples of the Australian Parliament being used actively to support the perpetuation of right wing speech, hate soon for their anti Islam, anti feminist, anti immigration, white supremacy uh, ideologies. So that's one example. Another example, I think, is the high profile Moody personalities expressing racist views on mainstream platforms um, in Australia. One example is Eddie Maguire, a high-profile media personality who used his national radio platform to suggest Adam Goods, who's a highly talented Indigenous football player, should be used to promote the musical King Kong. Terry ann Kennelly, who's an iconic media personality um, in Australia, made racist stereotyped comments about Aboriginal people on a mainstream morning TV program um, when she was told by another media personality that she sounded quite racist she undertook a defensive campaign of denial, which saw her attack the professionalism and integrity of the woman who had um, accused her of being racist. In another example, in 2016, Sonia Kruger, who's the host of a primetime breakfast TV show, vilified Muslim people when she said Australia should close its borders to those of the Islamic faith because she would like to feel safe. While there was certainly public attention that called out their racism at the time, in all three cases, the personalities being racist retained um, their high profiles, positions uh, and platforms at that time. The last example I want to just briefly touch on is the um, what we've seen over the last, through, uh, last few years, sorry, is the infiltration of far-right ideologies into anti-lockdown and anti-vax uh, movements in Australia. So, for example, the replication of the conservative family values in the use of you can say no to the jab, also a slogan that was used by the anti-marriage equality movement in Australia in 2017. We've seen mm. the proliferation of conspiracy theories, not only around vaccines and health concerns, but also around freedom of movement, government control and tracking devices, conspiracy theories favoured by the far right. And we've seen far right political pa parties spreading mis and disinformation about COVID and vaccines. In the same way that white supremacists can feel threatened by the rapid changes in Western society, the anti-lockdown movement feels threatened, feel threatened by the rapid changes in their world order that COVID um, brought with it. And in many ways, far-right ideologues um, capitalised on the sentiments and visibility of anti-lockdown um, movements to espouse their own far-right agendas. Um, and this, of course, was a platform on an unprecedented scale. These may seem like isolated incidents, um, but they are increasingly evident across mainstream media and political platforms in Australia. The populist mainstreaming of racism and claims of anti-white racism normalises such claims and provides recognition and legitimacy to those making them. While these views have long existed in the societal fringes of conservative right-wing discourses, they're also prevalent in mainstream society. Populist mainstreaming takes many forms, from political legitimisation, such as former Prime Minister John Howard routinizing and normalising the racism of Pauline Hanson's One Nation Party in the early 2000s, which then actually set the direction of, of political um, 
policy for the next two decades in Australia, to the invitation to right-wing hate speakers such as Milo Yiannopoulos and Jordan Pearson to address Australia's parliament, to the tolerance of the high-profile racists in retaining positions of leadership and power. This not only emboldens racism in the everyday, but it works to establish racism as an acceptable or tolerable norm in society. So just in conclusion, am I going all right, John, for time? I'll just wrap this up. Great. Um, just some final thoughts. I think over the last two decades, the Australian political landscape has turned increasingly to the right, and this has been spurred um, by the political dominance of Australia's Conservative Liberal Party, which has governed for the last um, 20 of the last 25 years, as well as the ascendance of far, um, various far-right political parties. So the formation of groups such as One Nation, Rise Up Australia, the Australian Liberty Alliance and the Australian Conservatives, they've all helped to push narrow expressions of Australian identity out of the political margins and onto the national um, stage. One Nation took a famously strong line on immigration and multiculturalism in the 1990s with um, party leader Pauline Hanson calling for a radical review of immigration policy and the abolition of multiculturalism. More recently, she sought to capitalise on anti-Islam um, sentiment and has pushed the belief that whites are victims who are not protected by anti-racism legislation or social practices. And in late 2018, Senator Cory Bernardi, who was the lead leader of the Australian Conservatives Party, released a number of blog posts attacking the recognition of white privilege. According to Bernardi, and I quote, this white privilege nonsense is a contagion and is offensive, if not racist, towards many Australians. These constitute some of the ongoing tensions that define our policy and public debates over migration and national identity in Australia and the way nationalist white supremacy ideologies have come to define these debates. While our politicians jockey to create the definitive understanding of what the um, Australian national identity is and who should belong, the Australian public, and in particular those who feel threatened by the nature of these debates, find themselves in an environment rife for the politics of fear and division. The theme that emerges, emerges from these policy debates mm. um, and which we re see reflected in the populist media is a powerful dichotomy, I think. The struggle between our potential as a national people that can embrace its cultural diversity and what and what we need um, to safeguard, typically articulated as the need to protect our white colonial heritage or white national identity. And I will leave it there as well. I look forward to questions. All right, thank you, thank you. And so, Josh, your turn. All right, thank you. Just sharing screen. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me, John? Everyone? No, good to go. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm speaking to you today uh, from Melbourne, Australia, and the, uh, the land of the Wurundjeri people, uh, and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. And it's actually a, an interesting day to be talking about um, Indigenous Australians because today the, the actual wording for a referendum uh, was put forward um, to the Australian people by our Prime Minister, which will give, if, if approved, um, a voice and recognition for Indigenous Australians in Parliament. So it's actually a really important day in this country's history at the moment. So the two previous presentations have uh, very ably covered uh, aspects of racism, the far right and, and populism in Australia. I propose a slightly different lens here, that of masculinity and religion. Both are perceived by far-right populists and extremists to face existential threat and are central in many ways to their political agenda. Today, I'll start by giving a little context to where Australia currently finds itself. The story behind the emergence of far-right populism, the Australian far-right and growth in textus religion that ideologically intersects with these developments is one of decline, a sense of deep loss and anger as an attempt is made to claw back a perceived loss of power. And really at the crux of this is angry men, which is really what I focus on in most of my work. And there's no shortage of that at the moment. Okay, that down. So the, uh, here in Australia, we've just had a roughly 10 year period of hard right populist government with a trail of economic destruction this is left behind. Uh, and this could be argued to extend back to, to really 1996 with a, about a five year window um, where we had a, a slightly centrist government. 
In 2022, uh, due largely to the, uh, the Morrison uh, Liberal government, Australia recorded its worst ever score on the Transparency International Corruption Index. That's a decline similar to Hungary over that period. We've seen rapidly rising socioeconomic inequality, driven by an almost pathological pursuit of free market policies in relation to the uh, public sector and industries requiring state support, whilst enabling economic cartels, including the Murdoch media empire. Much of this has been uh, tied to the housing market. Populist policies have been aimed at wealthy, middle-aged homeowners, and we've seen a continuation of hardline anti-refugee offshoring policies that have now been exported uh, around the world and have become influential in the UK with their Rwanda strategy, the US and other Western nations. This is not to mention the extreme white populists in the Australian Parliament, including Pauline Hanson, who in 2017 wore a burqa onto the floor of the Senate. Uh, former Queensland Senator Fraser Anning, who openly consorted with far-right extremists, and others such as pro-Trump Alex Antic, who appeared on the Alex Jones Infowars uh, show and stated his desire to drain the billabong, or George Christensen, who appeared on, appeared on Steve Bannon's War Room program. Such actors have brought, uh, been brought into the conspiracy theories popularised online in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Evangelical uh, Christian, I'm, I'm going to speak to a series of dot points, and I suppose I'm speaking from the concept of the lay person, uh, the, the context of the lay person who might struggle to make sense of these, these different strands. We've seen evangelical Christian Pacific Islanders refuse to acknowledge sporting code pride events. We've seen far right extremists uh, convicted of inciting hate convert recently to Islam. We've seen the most powerful institution on the face of the earth, the Catholic Church which for years has obfuscated and impeded the investigations into long-term child sexual abuse by priests, proclaim itself a victim, impeded by anti-discrimination legislation from practising its freedom of religion by being unable to fire gay teachers. A practising evangelical Christian prime minister, pictured here in the middle, um, in one of the most secular nations on earth, holds prayer, held prayer meetings inside the prime ministerial offices and claimed that he laid hands on constituents whilst pushing to legislate a Religious Discrimination Act. Then a retired uh, former member of federal parliament, known in a pejorative sense as the member for Manila, uh, keynote a church and state conference, declaring that Satan is the hero and patron saint of modern culture, and that a satanic influence has crept into politics, and that the West will cease to exist within our lifetime. We've seen severe backlashes against efforts to teach children safe and healthy sexuality in school settings, and in the past month, a group known as Christian Lives Matter, who've been around for a few years, parade through progressive inner city suburbs with high uh, LGBTQ populations, chanting the Hail Mary. Yesterday in Sydney, we saw violent clashes between this group, Christian Lives Matter, and, uh, and trans rights activists, although the violence was very much one way. At the funeral of George Pell, Cardinal George Pell, who was at the centre of a global controversy for his alleged involvement in sexual abuse, which resulted in his imprisonment and eventual release on appeal, former Australian Prime Minister at his funeral proclaimed him as having undergone a modern day crucifixion and declared him a saint for our times. These developments have shaped the role of religion in public life in Australia. In the context of historic lows in church attendance, we see a hardening of religious identity particularly amongst evangelical Christians and conservative Catholics. We shouldn't overlook that in this context, uh, however, um, there's also for a prolonged period of time been a hardening of Islamic identity, particularly amongst second and third generation Australian Muslims. Uh, a very small percentage who left to fight the Islamic State movement in the period 2014 to 17, but uh, many more who had their uh, passports cancelled. So we've seen the uh, religion as it's uh, found itself to be, uh, adherents have found themselves to feel marginalised, they've, they've pushed back in a, in a multitude of ways. To the far right, far right actors have emerged, basing their tactics and structures on US groups such as the Proud Boys. Their activities have ranged from public and incendiary protest tactics, using the Nazi salute in Jewish suburbs and in front of our state parliament, and attending anti-COVID lockdown marches, to stage photo opportunities in public space, pamphleting and forming clubhouses where they train in mixed martial arts and wage a war on Telegram, the encrypted messaging app. 
The violent potential of these groups and the individuals associated with them has already been well established. Christchurch terrorist Brenton Tarrant expressed his admiration for fascist figurehead Blair Cottrell and was in contact with current leader of the National Socialist Network, Thomas Sewell, a former schoolboy in uh, Melbourne's leafy eastern suburbs. Sewell himself has recently been convicted of assault, punching a black security <coughs> guard in the face, and is facing more charges for violence, although to this point police have prosecuted this without reference to ideological orientation. The various groups, including the Australian Proud Boys, derived from the American group of the same name, the Australian Christian Fascists, European Australian Movement, uh, NSN and so on, are primarily constituted by younger men who presumably spend their days plotting to bring out the Boogaloo or the Day of the Rope and practising MMA. At one point, ASIO, the Australian um, Security Intelligence Organisation, reported that monitoring the far right constituted almost half their caseload although the most recent update in the past couple of weeks placed this at approximately 30%. Whilst espousing hate-filled rhetoric, these groups have been careful to distance themselves from terrorism online and proclaim themselves as activists, despite their hate-filled and illegal, arguably illegal rhetoric that breaches many laws related to hate speech. We've seen tabloid media commentators in unison with their hard-right extremist contemporaries in politics rail against the recognition of diversity. Men by the far right are framed as losing out and being displaced by feminism, women's rights, trans and LGBTQ recognition, and political correctness, or as they like to call it, wokeness. Uh, religion or faith is equally claimed to be undermined by immorality, uh, human rights, secularism, and a powerful liberal, or as they say, Jewish elite. In this context, far right textualist Christians and others have adeptly mobilised both masculinity and religion as recruitment mechanisms, urging men to reclaim the power that they, they once possessed both domestically and against their enemies. Now, I should note as a, as a small footnote, there has been a change of government in Australia over the last year, which may remedy at least a small portion of this, but it would take a lot more than uh, one year to see any sort of real change. So how do we unpack and make sense of these developments? To understand the far right and populist right, we must pay attention to masculinity, by which we mean the social construction of what it is to be a man. Masculinity defines the social expectations of manhood and the social structuring of hierarchies based on the privileging of what is considered masculine and the devaluation of that considered feminine. The participants in far right groups are primarily men. But beyond this, such groups' origins, ideologies, internal processes and means of recruitment are tied in powerful ways to masculinity. That is, they are tied to the political, cultural and economic relations of many men's lives, to influential ideologies about men and gender and to narratives about men's roles and position in society. Men's participation in some contexts is shaped by a variety of factors associated with masculinity, including but not limited to limited economic conditions, the changing nature of work, including casualisation, the loss of a job for life and welfare safety net, uh, perceived political repression, and particularly amongst white collar workers who, who make up a good proportion of, of the new alt and far right, a sense of aggrieved entitlement, a perceived loss of the respect, recognition, and social standing to which they're entitled as men. To understand this, we need to look at the changing status of men and work over the past five decades since the introduction of free market economics and its displacement of Keynesian economics. Involvement may be driven by men's resentment and blame directed at the women and minorities who are perceived to have benefited from male economic, legal and political subordination and be directed at these groups and governments that are perceived to have facilitated it. This may be grounded in a sense of shame and we really need to talk about the important role of emotions in this context. We see a sense of shame, humiliation and anger as social trajectories stagnate and turn downward. As Guy Standing put it, anger, anime, anxiety and alienation undermine the traditional uh, sense of masculinity bound in a sense of self-reliance, strength and the ability to provide for one's family. In the context of time, I'm not going to go too much into further sort of exploring masculinity other than to note Pennell, uh, sorry, um, Connell and Measure Smith's important differentiation between hegemonic masculinity as the ideal way of being a man in a society, it's normative, uh, but only a minority of men might enact it. 
It's the most honoured way of being a man. And a sense of subordinated masculinity. The, uh, the sense that um, uh, you, you know, you're not really a man by societal standards. And uh, that's viewed in, by people like Greg Noble as emphasising a hyper-masculinity, a performative dimension here that's emphasised through displays of physicality and toughness. So really we see a mix of factors by, driven by free market economics, including anti-worker industrial relations legislation, casualisation, and more recently the automation of some white collar functions, but also anti-discrimination legislation and a more empowered and educated female workforce on the other that have shattered this dream uh, and this um, and sort of evoke a sense of nostalgia amongst some men for a past that they perceive as lost. And this is actually uh, increasingly common across the spectrum. Actually, I'm going to go up because I'm now talking about religion. Sorry about that. So I do want to briefly touch on how we frame religion in these debates in relationship to populism as well. So one of the dominant tropes about the relationship of religion and populism is that religion has been hijacked by populists. Mizuki and McDonald, for example, argue that we're faced with the increasing exploitation of religion in political discourse by mainstream politicians and right-wing populists to, uh, to express belonging rather than believing, to defend the territory of Christendom rather than the values of Christianity. And they assert that church, el um, church elites typically condemn the instrumentalisation of religion for these purposes. However, it's argued here that while some groups do embrace an empty and rhetorical form of Christian identity, organised religion is an important uh, ingredient of the contemporary global right-wing popular surge. Attempts to exonerate organised religion and religious leadership from responsibility for the demonisation of other faiths and minorities show a startling lack of understanding about how the theological framing of truth amongst fundamentalist textualist elements of organised religion shape highly energised and often hostile responses to other faiths that have absolutely everything to do with religion. Furthermore, far from being passive actors, organised mainstream uh, religion, be it through denominational leaders, factional figureheads or publicly aligned politicians, are actively competing for political status and power, pursuing religious exemptions from secular laws and taking sides, either with the establishment or the new demagogues, in their attempt to achieve survivability or contrastingly to grow. Internal theological and political cleavages within religion um, for example, the, uh, um, the hardline uh, conservative um, bishops and cardinals, uh, as opposed to um, Pope Francis, uh, or within various um, denominations here in Australia as well, uh, are really critical and, and often involve significant animosity. Those on each side seek the same reward, legitimacy and opportunity to lead the institution in the direction they want it to go. And this is particularly the case where authority is not devolved. The possession of a unique claim to truth, that is, an understanding and unique relationship with God or a supreme deity, is an essential component of all, if not, um, or most, if not all, religions. Indeed, the most significant and indeed proudest claim, as Corbett says, of any theological proposition is to be true. So for some deeply pious faith holders, the claim to truth leads to a journey of discovery and attempts to reconcile this with other faith traditions through interfaith work and ecumenicalism. But for many others, the claim to a unique possession of truth defines the boundary of religious community. Those who use truth claims to demarcate community may be understood as textualists or fundamentalists. And to this extent, I frame Catholic fundamentalists as Catholicists in the same way that scholarship has framed Islamists. Historically, challenges to truth claims by perceived imposters and all that that meant politically have been dealt with through violent means whether by symbolic repudiation using powerful language or conquest. And there's a long history of this uh, in, in every religious tradition. And we see this globally now where religion is being mobilised as part of a project of national renewal, be it Putin in the Orthodox Church, the Law and Justice Party in Poland, um, evangelicals in the US um, and, and both the Catholic Church and evangelicals in Australia, Erdogan and Islam and, and so on. Textualist religious actors are keen to court political power. They see the decline of their base, uh, that is decreasing religious adherence, and they seek the power to shape institutions and laws. So, uh, for example, the, the primary 
uh, example of this over the last um, last five or ten years would be the successful capturing of the U.S. Supreme Court uh, by conservative religious conservatives, and and we're now seeing the uh, the, the beginning of a long term impact of that. So where are these key intersections emerging? Uh, we, we, we know that there's key intellectual, ideological, and uh, I suppose um, affinities between uh, hard right populists, far right extremists, and textualist religious actors occurring. They all claim possession of a universal truth, a sense of having been marginalized and a powerful sense of persecution and victimhood. They have a nostalgia for an imagined lost past. They all carry with them an aggressive anti-secularism, a, a need to reassert Christian values and morality, and whilst uh, slightly differing iconographies, nonetheless, um, there, there are many patterns and similarities uh, that you can identify in, in, in actually examining them. We see a reassertion of traditional household structures, that is, restoring men to a position of societal don dominance across the far right, Islamist groups, Manosphere groups, uh, conservative um, politics as a whole, we see this um, really strong preoccupation with restoring men as head of the household, as breadwinners, uh, women as um, being put back in the home to breed, to, to basically uh, bring about the next generation of the race or, or the religion. And so we see a strong um, anti-women attitude against the right to choose. Uh, there's a powerful anti-feminism, anti-rights. Uh, there's a depiction amongst many of these groups of, of Western women as licentious whores. Misogyny is, in many respects, a gateway to the far right in its contemporary manifestation. We see a hatred of all GTPIQ communities. And if <clears> anyone's been paying attention to developments here in Australia, there's a trans, um, anti-trans um, activist touring the country. And, and so the far right, you'll see in this picture on the right-hand side, have actually um, attended some of these protests. Um, if you look to the bottom left here, we see the um, Christian Lives Matter movement uh, marching through the streets of Newtown in Sydney. And if you look to the top left here, you see angry young men, uh, Muslim men, protesting the Innocence of Muslims movie back in 2012. And, and it's really quite remarkable that in a, in a world where we talk about youth being disengaged, that increasingly it's young people, young angry men, who are really becoming more active in these spaces. We see this hatred of other groups, the other, uh, a powerful anti-Semitism emerging across the spectrum of actors. We see anti-science attitudes, a hatred of the political left, the belief of a global conspiracy of a liberal elite. And, and, and interestingly, race is playing less of a role in, in some of these dimensions. It's about the ideological orientation more so. So implications, well, as I've said, we're seeing the convergence of um, different forms of textualist religion, far right attitudes, hardline uh, right wing uh, conservatism in, in terms of the way that they view the world. And, and here we see them uh, effectively view the West as amoral, as, a, as constituted by one big global conspiracy theory. Um, you can see the various groups represented here uh, in, in this picture. And so whilst what, what we need to understand better is the extent to which their attitudes intersect with mainstream values, mainstream politicians and members of the community. We need to understand the extent to which these, these groups, which remain small, are capable of building a larger movement, are capable of building a larger um, profile in, in the wider population, because that's where the real damage can be done. And it is a critical time in the aftermath of COVID-19 lockdowns where the world is facing significant um, you know, set of economic challenges that we haven't seen for many generations. So we have an opportunity to deal with these challenges, but we face really significant uh, powerful consequences if we get it wrong. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um... We can go to questions now. Anyone want to ask a question of our participants? Mm -hmm. 
John, I have a question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my question is uh, actually, first of all, thank you very much for this uh, interesting and insightful uh, presentations. Uh, I, I, I have learned a lot uh, about uh, populism and uh, far right and uh, racism in Australia. Thank you very much. My question is to Rachel uh, and maybe uh, other panelists, uh, and it is about the role of the conventional media in the populist uh, radical right and uh, far right politics in Australia. Especially, I wonder uh, about the role of the visual, audio and print media outlets, which have been uh, semi-monopolized uh, by uh, Rupert, Rupert Murdoch's uh, media imperium. We know how his uh, strong media played role in the UK and the US politics on behalf of populist radical right and far right political actors. Since Murdoch family first started to build uh, their media empire in Australia, could you please elaborate the issue in Australian, uh, Australian political context? Thank you. Sure, I mean, uh, media is not my my area but i think um i was just thinking as you were asking that we did a just finished a big project looking at um misinformation the spread of misinformation during covid 19 here in australia what well, actually particularly it was looking in new south wales um but the interesting thing that came out of uh, one of the interesting things that came out of that was we were asking people where they got their information about covid from um and mainstream media in australia was still one of the key um the key platforms for people to get that information. So I think we talk a lot and we've seen a lot about the diversification of media, um, particularly people going to online um, platforms and social media for their news and that kind of thing. But I think that just that particular project and that particular, you know, question and the data that came out of that, I think reinforced the fact that for many people, mainstream media is still their, their key source of information um, when it came to COVID, like an emergency um, information. So I think partially for me, it's like we've got diversification of media. People can go to a lot of different places to get their news. And part of that, there's a good part of that, right? Because there's much more diverse ways that we can get our news rather than relying on one or two Murdoch um, publications. But this still seems to me... Um, a, a prevalence of some of those mainstream platforms. So we looked particularly in Australia at Channel 7, 9 and 10, which are the big TV um, networks, and that's still where people go for, for their news, like the majority of the um, the population go for their news. So it's, it's a problem because I think we think we've got more diversity, but I guess in having more diversity, it also means that people can go to lots of different places and get lots of dis and misinformation as well. So it's it's the hard one um, to counter in some ways it's good that we've got diversification in some ways it allows more misinformation to be out there in the world um, and then at the same time we're still relying on these mainstream platforms for our for our news so I don't know much more than to answer for that like I think it is problematic the media in Australia but I don't know if Imogen and Josh you have other things you might Want to add yeah, to that. I, I can just add to that. I, I think uh, COVID-19 um, produced a big resurgence of reliance on national broadcasting organisations, ABC in Australia, Radio New Zealand here, BBC, right? People didn't, by and large, most people didn't during COVID-19 panic and lockdowns, uh, spend their time uh, scouring the internet for the latest conspiracy theories. They switched on the radio to listen to the news, the latest news, how many new cases there were and so on and so forth. So there was a big research of <clears throat> popularity in mainstream broadcasting organizations, but particularly the national uh, broadcasting organizations and they regained uh, a lot of ground that they had lost in the previous two or three decades to um, the, 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 the multiplicity of satellite uh, stations and, uh, and, 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 and so on and so forth. I mean, 
whether they've been able to cling on to that audience since <clears throat> the COVID issues died down a bit is, a, is another matter, but certainly uh, COVID, uh, as, as I've argued uh, in, in a number of places, actually um, uh, proved to be an antidote to populism. Uh, one, of, one, one aspect of which was the way in which um, the mainstream media uh, made a comeback. Mm. Um, I could add something as well, perhaps. So um, I can see there's another question, so I'll try not to um, go on too much. But yeah, I guess just building on what um, John and, and Rachel said as well, um, sort of I have been looking at um, in the context of um, the book the manuscript um, that I'm sort of finalising with a couple of people at the moment, looking at the sort of uses of uh, environmental politics by the Australian far right. We're also looking at intersections between um, climate denialism um, and resignation and accelerationism and that sort of um, tracking via the mainstream um, news media, highly concentrated corporate news media in Australia. Um, and I think there's there's some interesting kind of case examples there, even in respect of conspiracy being circulated during the 2019-2020 Black Summer bushfires. Um, so there was sort of a hashtag ars um, arson emergency, um, you know, which erroneously blamed the devastating um, bushfires that were happening on Australia's east coast at that time on um, sort of arsonists. So there was a conspiracy theory that it was either uh, fire jihad or arsonists or the Australian Greens were to blame because they had been ostensibly against controlled burning practices, which they're usually actually in favour of. Um, so these, all of these conspiracy theories circulated via Murdoch media in concerted campaigns and they actually filtered um, in part through alternative far-right news sites to the mainstream media circulating on social media, also with bots. There's been some interesting you know, campaigns sort of bot, um, <laughs> coordinated bot campaigns. Um, I'd, I'd just say as well, there's uh, sort of Scott Pointing and Briskman um, have researched um, anti-Muslim prejudice, which was um, sort of emphasised in the Australian news, news media through the sort of post-2001 securitization of Muslim communities. Um, and Busbridge and Moffat and others as well did a study of the sort of cultural Marxism conspiracy and its circulation through, there's been a bit of research about that, particularly in the Australian, which is the sort of <clears throat> our sole national broadsheet. Um, yeah, so I just thought I would, because I have those <laughs> case studies right in front of me um, of Murdoch, I sort of thought I would uh, highlight them as well. Yeah. Can we have the question from Jalan, please? Yes, hi. Um, yes, um, I have two questions, actually. One for Josh. Um, uh, so from your presentation, it seems that masculinity is more linked to extreme and radical populism, but aided uh, by the mainstream, for, for the mainstream, on the mainstreaming, uh, because it normalizes this um, rhetoric. Um, but could you say that mainstream populism is less gendered and radical extreme? Um, and for Rachel, um, in your presentation, it showed that there was a gender split that was something more like 60 to 40 or so in Australia. Would you say that that mirrors general global trends or is that context specific? Yeah, thank you. I'll just jump in on that first question. Um, so obviously a 20 minute presentation, you've kind of got to make some broad sort of uh, assertions. Uh, so the book uh, that I, I put up there for everyone to stare at for about 10 minutes, um, The New Demagogues, was basically um, built around a survey that I conducted with uh, Professor Brian Turner uh, and Ipsos. Yes. And um, that was a global uh, masculinity survey across 28 countries with 19,000 respondents, men and women. And uh, so in, in that book, I used the data related to Australia, the US and the UK. But... Speaking to Australia, for example, um, there, we, we ask the same questions globally. Some countries, you couldn't actually ask those questions um, around gender, for example. But we looked at, for example, measures of hard and soft misogyny. So the idea that um, 
women deserve equal rights to men, which is in many respects, given societal norms, uh, a measure of uh, hard misogyny. And about 5% of men and about 2% of women uh, I, I, I disagree that women deserve equal rights to men. Uh, but that was much higher amongst younger men than it was amongst older men. But then we asked a, a measure of soft misogyny, so the, right, the idea that rights of women have gone too far, which ties into all the cultural sort of arguments going on, in particular across the conservative uh, spectrum. Interestingly, about 34% of young men, aged 18 to 34, um, viewed the, agreed with the proposition that rights of women have gone too far, uh, and, and it gradually declined with age. But interestingly, women, uh, about 24 to 25% of Australian women agreed with that proposition as well, which is quite astounding, particularly when you look internationally and the, and the figures were much lower. Um, so it was, Australia was in many respects comparable to the US and uh, um, UK in its results, but on that measure of uh, attitudes to women, much lower. Then attitudes to minorities, Australia had some quite high um, on the proposition that um, uh, minorities are threatening or undermining uh, national uh, national cohesion or constitute a threat to national security. And um, older men were much more likely to respond affirmatively to that, whilst younger men were less. So this is a global survey. It provides us a, a dimension of, um, or an insight into the normative attitudes that are out there that intersect with uh, these far-right extremist propositions. Uh, and so really, when you argue that, when you can say that at least a third of men hold, uh, to some extent, anti-women attitudes. And, and that's one of the primary uh, elements of the, the far right and, and hardline conservative Christian sort of narrative, then there is a potential for intersection and there's a potential susceptibility to these narratives. So that's what we really need to understand, that normative dimension. And I, I, it might be less interesting and less, less uh, sexy, so to speak, than looking at the, uh, what hardline extremists are saying and doing. But really, we need to understand what's happening in wider society and the extent to which they may subscribe in some way, shape or form to these views. Thank you very much. Yeah, just on the um, <clears throat> second one, I think if, if it was the slide where I was looking at the um, demographic breakdown, it was 53 male to 47 female. But that, um, just to put it in context, that's um, a survey um, that was looking at the general um, national, sorry, the national population uh, in Australia. So th those numbers <coughs> are almost on par with our breakdown. Um, it's about 51, 49 in Australia for the national pop pop population. Um, but I think the interesting thing, therefore, if we go 51, 49, we've got 53, 47, it's not that big a um, difference to what the national population is, except that men are slightly more. But my main, I think my main takeaway from that stat is that it's actually much closer than we probably m might think it would be. So there's not as big a gap, I think, between male and female attitudes in that particular um, aspect. And I don't know how that differs globally. I only, only know that um, in that that's in the context of the Australian um, situation. Thank you for yes. Okay, we've got another question from uh, Bullent. Yes, thank you very much again. Uh, my question is for Emojian. Uh, with an overall assessment, uh, which concept defines the style of contemporary populist politics in Australia best? May cultural populism or civilizationalist populism be an eff efficient concept to make a kind of generalization about current Australian populis populism? Thank you. So you said sort of cultural versus civilizational? Yeah. Yeah, so um, to be honest, I don't want to um, sort of fudge it. I'm not really a populism expert. <laughs> I don't I don't usually research necessarily through that lens, even though I do find it useful sort of in, as I sort of showed in this applic application. Um, I think certainly... Um, <clears throat> I would, I would tend to associate the kind of cultural populism with the, I guess, characteristic propaganda tropes and the modes of discourse sort of in line with um, Benjamin Moffat's sort of description that it's really important the, to emphasise the style, the direct communication style, 
Um, so perhaps in some national contexts, bypassing mainstream media, but then sometimes, as in sort of the example I just mentioned in the in response to the question yeah. about media, that there can be very much um, crossover in these sort of new media environments with traditional uh, legacy media, so broadcast and print, um, which are actually uh, they've got they've, they've got a kind of a dialectical relationship with new media, uh, including through automated um, postings um, and so on. So. In so, so I guess insofar as I'm conceptualising cultural um, populism through that lens as the sort of mode of communication style, um, I would say, you know, that that is um, prominent in the Australian context as it is elsewhere. Um, and civilizationism, I suppose, and I might be slightly, you know, I'm not sure if I'm slightly misinterpreting the distinction between them, but... There, there is, you know, in the Australian context as well, um, a growth in far right narratives about the decline of Western civilization. Um, so, and those are often articulated through um, also land environmental kind of narratives. The sort of we, um, uh, you know, curated flew here and you know um, arrived here and curated the landscape. Um, in such a way as to to bring civilization to you know sort of um, a kind of savage environment that kind of language um, you know is is very very prominent and that's really prominent on the um, so even the arrival of the first fleet at Botany Bay in 1788 with the first fleet of um, convicts um, with British settlers was. Um, imagery of that, um, famous um, uh, paintings depicting that are sort of shared, the images of, of those are shared on, you know, the telegram pages of the European Australian Movement, which is a partner organisation to the National Socialist Network, you know, which was mentioned before. Um, so explicitly national socialist groups uh, really explicitly propagandise on this basis of um, you know, Aryan civilizationism, bringing um, civilization to a continent that was either, you know, formally conceptualized as terra nullius in sort of Lockean terms, so empty, but, you know, otherwise conceptualized as um, sort of an untamed wilderness, which, you know, we know not to be the case, uh, and wilderness narratives, obviously, to have their colonial underpinnings as well. So maybe that's a bit long-winded, but I think both are prevalent, um, and I would say more civilizationism perhaps goes more to the substance of the populist appeal which is you know pride in settler colonialism um and cultural populism perhaps most in the australian context as elsewhere is is through these modes of expression these propagandizing media um yeah maybe that's hopefully that helps any more questions Okay. Ali Selchuk, raise hand. I I have a question. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the fascinating presentations. Actually, I want to ask uh, Professor Mojan Richards and maybe the other panelists as well. Uh, Miss Richards, you talked about the genocide of uh, indigenous people uh, in Australia. Uh, what role does genocide play in the formation of populist moments and identities? Do they deny it? Do they recognize it? How, how does it play? So I suppose the examples that I was giving, um, particularly the sort of post-World War II examples, are really extreme, right? Uh, so there is a, a certain degree of pride in genocidal national narratives. Um, explicitly expressed. You know, there are, obviously, there's a um, a lot of traditions along a sort of a multi-spectrum um, right, radical right, far right. Um, and so, you know, the degree, the, the types of engagement with Australian political history, you know, differ according to what works for those audiences, I would say, what um, has um, the most purchase 
I think. And um, I, I I suppose, yeah, so so probably as with other contexts, I think I, I, I can't really generalise, I suppose, um, across all the radical far and extreme kind of right in Australia and say that there is some clear current of approaches to the uh, Australia's history of colonisation. But um, I, I think it's it, an important distinction is that, you know, what these groups are trying to do is in part access like identitarian narratives, especially with this idea of re-migration, you know, so compared to the Euro European context, um, there's similar tropes here, especially given the sort of Australia's border policies and offshore processing and narratives around that and the uses of that by far-right groups um, internationally like Casa Pound and Generation Identity. But um, it's not really possible in sort of the Australian, um, Canadian, US context to reconcile those claims of European indigeneity with the sort of identitarian ideal so it's kind of settler colonial white supremacy. It's sort of, so civilizationism again, becomes potentially more important even in that respect as, uh, and yeah, so that's sort of answering the previous question, but yeah, I can't, I can't, I'm not sure exactly where I was going with that. Does that help <laughs> a little bit? Um, I, I guess what, what, yeah. So what the importance of, genocidal narratives I think I think the importance of genocidal narratives speaks to that impossibility of reconciling the identitarianism ideas of race and place the kind of quasi Eurasianist connections with land and territory as well um, for the Australian context relying on this um, neo-colonial now white supremacy which has its roots in those genocidal histories. So they sort of necessarily form and comprise a part of that, which is, you know, we have a right to access um, and exploit the lands and territories by virtue of this history. So it's actually even more kind of pride of history and place, I would say, than other uh, in other contexts. Hopefully yeah, that helps. And, and at the present time as well, I mean, there's a great deal of support uh, amongst the far right for for genocidal activists. I mean, you sent uh, we have, we have an Australian uh, mass murderer who's going to be in New Zealand prisons for life for his uh, slaughter of um, fifty one Muslims in Christchurch three or four years ago. I mean, it's it's not the practice in New Zealand to name this person to give him any air at all. Right, uh, that, that's uh, that's the way we 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 deal with him here. But I mean, there are, uh, and uh, his so-called manifesto um, quoted um, Breivik in Norway, and uh, also made favourable references to Donald Trump and so on and so forth. If you look at some of the mass shootings that have taken place in the U.S. Yeah, it's a, uh, you can see the genocidal intent of, of those actors, whether they're trying to gun down Jews or blacks or, or, or Latin Americans and so on. It's as if they, they see themselves as defending the white race against uh, the, 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 these intruders to what should be their territory. Okay, so anyway, um, do we have any more questions? Yes. Uh, this time my question is uh, for uh, Josh. Uh, you mentioned that the religions uh, uh, were uh, or have been hijacked by populists. Uh, do you mean also Muslim immigrants? Uh, do you see some traces of uh, this hijacking uh, among the uh, some Islamist uh, migrant uh, Muslims, or just you refer to Christianity? Yeah, so I think um, what I'm doing here is uh, critiquing the concept or the notion that uh, religion's been hijacked by populists. 
because at the, at the crux of every religion is a concern with societal change. And, um, and at their heart, um, in particular with textualist forms of religion, uh, which uh, really uh, make, it, make truth claims, then we see um, a, effectively a concern with um, setting themselves apart, with contesting power uh, and, and doing whatever it takes to further the faith. And so in the context of Islam, Catholicism uh, and Christianity, uh, every, every great faith, um, we see um, you know, a, a, a willingness to align with great power, whether or not um, where, where it serves the religion's interest. So I, I'm, I focus primarily on Christianity because I think it was completely underdone. Uh, there was this massive preoccupation with what was going on within political Islam. But I think actually uh, Christ, Catholicism in particular, I was actually the director of a research institute at the Australian Catholic University. I was exposed firsthand to Catholic politics. I, I met with uh, George Pell at the Vatican um, at one point uh, at the, and in his office. And I asked him, I said to you, what I said to him, what are the um, what's the key, what are the key threats to the Catholic Church right now? And his, his answer was number one, uh, identity politics and Islam. And this was the number three in the Vatican. And so he he viewed the, the <coughs> Catholicism face an existential threat and, and was seriously concerned. Now, given this was at the height of um, Islamic states, you know, powers and so on around 2016. But um, he also, um, you know, he had pictures of well, just a big bookshelf of Margaret Thatcher um, on, on, his, on his wall. So, you know, this was someone who was a very politically savvy, politically engaged and, and viewed the church as having other enemies, so other faiths, but also gay activists, um, you know, the, the push for recognition of same-sex marriage and other things. And, and really, this wasn't someone whose religion had been hijacked. This was someone who was clearly steering uh, effectively a political ship um, to further what he, uh, you know, the purposes and, and, the, and the power of the church. And this is, this is present across the different traditions. And, and so if you understand that, you can understand why there's a convergence with, uh, with other, other faiths. And, and, and as they all seek to band together in many respects against what they see as this uh, immoral, uh, corrupt world that's um, attacking them and, and their views and, and their rights. Okay, uh, Jelen, you want to ask your question again? Yes, if that's okay. Um, actually, it's just um, in response to that answer. Um, how do you see, Josh, the, the approach of, um, of groups in Europe that have uh, a pseudo progressionist approach, so protection of um, LGBTQ communities and so on, in, for example, um, Northern Europe or um, the Netherlands and so on, because they have an approach that seems to be um, secularist and protection of secularism, which is almost religious. And um, I wanted to get your thoughts on that. I suppose I would frame them as uh, contextualists, not textualists. Uh, they are about interpretation of, of the, you know, the effectively the holy books in context in relation to their the world around them, uh, and 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 they're open. They they view, for example, the uh, the message of Jesus as relating to you know the vulnerable and and those at the margins, rather than a black and white in or out sort of uh, perspective shaped by Old Testament. Um, uh, theology. So really, to me, I mean, you know, the, the progress in religion comes from its reading in context uh, and in context with, for example, contemporary technologies that are emerging. Uh, but what we're seeing is this: as people feel marginalised, they, they gain comfort in particular from the textualist reading, which is really focused on uh, you know, contestation, on us versus them on a very black and white narrative view of the world. Thank you. Okay. Does anyone else want to ask a question? Yes. 
No. All right. Well, um, I'm going to use that as the opportunity to wind things up now, um, as it's getting very late here in New Zealand. And uh, I hope you have a good day in Europe, uh, wherever you are. Good evening, nice evening, uh, while you still enjoy in Australia. Uh, thank you very much for your contributions. Thank you for. Um, coming along and listening to these great talks about Australia. And I hope uh, we can, our paths will all cross again at some point in the future. Okay, so thank you very much and uh, good night. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you, Dr. Fred. Thank you very for much. your great uh, moderation and uh, dear distinguished panelists. Uh, thank you very much for your very insightful presentations. And I would like to also uh, thank for our uh, attendees who enriched our uh, discussion. And uh, please mark your calendar for the next session, which will take place on the 27th of uh, April. And we will discuss uh, populism, macho fascism, and varieties of illiberalism in the Philippines. Um, I also wish you all a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you.